And now on that note, uh, we are going to be moving to our final session. And, you know, this is a very special guest that we have uh, joining us. We want to thank, of course, the Bank of Spain for doing this, facilitating this. And, and me on a personal note, I also want to thank the, the Bank of Spain governor who will be joining us now for, for doing this in full transparency, really taking all questions. Uh, pretty much no filter. So I really do appreciate that. And on that note, as I said, we are joined by Paulo Hernandez Ecos, who, as you know, is Bank of Spain governor. He is also a member of the European Governing Council, and uh, he's also a chairman of the uh, Basel Committee for Banking Supervision. So it's almost uh, a trilogy that is happening there. The Bank of Spain governor joining us now from Madrid. Thank you so much. I appreciate your time. We're very happy to have you. Thank you, Maria. And uh, let me also thank uh, you for the opportunity to, to see and listen some of my old good friends, uh, Angel, uh, Antonio, Pablo, Venceslao, and of course the Vice President. It was very interesting up to now. Well, we, we appreciate it. And, and uh, you know, there's so many questions that I want to put to you. I know the time is uh, very brief, but uh, there's so much happening for not just Spanish economy, but also the European uh, context. We know there has been a very real uh, shock to the economy. It's, it's, it's made it uneven. It's made it unequal. Some of the weaknesses become more obvious at a time of crisis. And now you're also seeing, uh, to some extent, markets, investors being whiplashed by good news, the fact that we have a vaccine. We know that Christine Lagarde has said that for the time being, that doesn't change anything. But I wonder, when you look at the overall picture, what would you say is the outlook for the Spanish economy? What do you factor in in terms of the response that should be put forward to help and prop up the economy over the short term? Hmm. No, uh, Maria, I can uh, more than agree with um, many of the adjectives that you've already used, because uh, I think, of course, they are all applicable to the European economy and in particular also to the to the Spanish uh, economy. Uh, it's obvious, uh, and it was already mentioned in the, during the panel that um, the Spanish economy uh, was very much affected by, by this uh, crisis. Also, that the persistence of the crisis uh, is, is being substantial and, and, and the outbreaks that uh, in our country we've been living since uh, the end of, uh, of August uh, demonstrate uh, this, this persistence. The heterogeneity, I think, is also a very relevant factor, which conditions also the, the optimality of the, of, the, of the different policy decisions to be taken. But perhaps the adjective that I uh, want to, to stress, that it is also obvious, but that it is also very important to have in mind, is the, the enormous uncertainty uh, uh, that we have over how the pandemic will evolve. Uh, it is true uh, that uh, now uh, the, the recent news about the effectiveness of various uh, vaccine uh, projects are clearly most welcome, but uh, in my view, uh, it will still take time to back to a situation in which restrictions are no longer needed. And um, till this uh, very uh, moment, I think uh, this uncertainty will, will, will stay with, uh, with us. Um, the persistence of the crisis, I think, is also an important factor because it makes also uh, uh, that the likelihood of this crisis uh, having more structural damage is also higher. No? And we are already observing some of this damage in terms of, for, for example, of the increase in public debt, also in private debt, the destruction of, 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 of a good number of firms, the increase in unemployment, and with this persistence, the probability of this increase um, uh, converting into uh, uh, long-term unemployment. And of course, uh, also an important factor is uh, so due to this heterogeneity is the, the increase in inequality that uh, we know that the recession is particularly affecting low wage workers uh, uh, in a more uh, fragile financial situation. And of course, this uh, inevitably will increase uh, inequality. So what, with all these conditions, your question, Maria, was what is the optimal, uh, let's say, response? And here, maybe I should emphasize uh, some, some, some principles. No? First, I think it's very important that um, and perhaps the main contribution that uh, uh, all policies, not only fiscal, by the way, but also monetary and macro and micro prudential uh, uh, policies uh, should do is to, to provide certainty. Okay, that's, uh, that's an important uh, element. Second uh, principle, uh, something that uh, I've been stressing since the beginning of the crisis and I think is a novelty from the, the response, uh, policy response to this crisis is that this time, uh, the policy uh, action uh, was uh, from, uh, from, uh, from from the different authorities was very complementary. Okay, so monetary policy uh, created a lot of uh, room for maneuver for fiscal, and fiscal policy uh, also helped, uh, for example, the, the, the balance sheets of, of the banks. And I think that maintaining this complementarity down the road, it will be also crucial. Um, and uh, uh, then in more general terms, given all those characteristics that I've just uh, mentioned, I think what it is important is to, uh, to have a combination 
of on the one hand uh, uh, keeping this uh, this uh, very strong uh, support and even increasing the support if, if needed while at the same uh, time uh, facing the structural damages uh, or even the structural changes, not necessarily damages, for example, those related to, to changes in, in some patterns of consumption that we are observing, uh, I think, in our countries, for example, due to, 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 to remote uh, working, uh, but that you allow uh, the economy to to, to, to do this adjustment in a proper in a proper way, because otherwise, of course, uh, the consequences in terms of uh, low potential output growth will also be uh, very, uh, very significant. And then, of course, if you combine all these elements, uh, my received, uh, just uh, talking about the domestic front, I guess that uh, we will have also time to talk about uh, of the, of the monetary policy front or, or even the macro, micro potential policy uh, front, but just uh, focusing on the, on the, on the domestic front and on, on fiscal policy is that, uh, well, in the short run, it's absolutely necessary to maintain uh, and even extending, uh, again, I'm, I'm emphasizing this, if necessary, the current uh, support measures. Of course, now, uh, given that the impact of the crisis, like I was saying, is now uh, more heterogeneous, uh, we need um, this support to be uh, very, uh, very targeted, as you were also uh, emphasizing before, uh, Maria. And um, then uh, what it is perhaps uh, more difficult is to focus also on avoiding this structural damage and allowing these structural uh, changes to, 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 to happen. Um, and just to give a, an example of what uh, this might uh, require, one, of course, of the main consequences of the crisis still now is that we have a, a corporate sector is that this, it is now uh, much more indebted that, uh, that we had at the beginning of the of the crisis. And it is important that we discriminate which uh, type of firms are, are viable and that, uh, that then uh, we need uh, then uh, to, 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 to make it the proper restructure of the debt. And for this, uh, for example, the government uh, on Tuesday, uh, they extended this moratoria for, uh, for the insolvency procedures, which I think is very right. But at the same time, uh, it is absolutely crucial that it is accompanied by a change in the procedures, in the current procedures of solvency uh, rules that uh, do not work properly in the Spanish uh, case, precisely to allow for this uh, debt restructuring to, to, to happen. And at the same time, of course, we also have to accept that we cannot indefinitely, or we should not, uh, 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 indefinitely uh, sustain sectors or firms whose level of activity uh, will structurally uh, decline and we need uh, them to adjust or even disappear if this is uh, if this is the, the case if their, their business models are not non, non viable no? so is this a combination of things that uh, for me I've been emphasizing this uh, since the, the second wave started that makes probably more difficult uh, to, to to manage uh, the, the, this second part of the crisis as, as compared to the to the first one on which the whatever it takes uh, that by, by Angel uh, was clearly um, the, the, the right uh, and the optimal uh, policy uh, uh, response. Now I think we have to to, de to make this combination, and, the, and to make this combination is uh, is not obvious. At the same time, um, with this uh, uh, more medium term perspective, but I think it's important also to, to have um, it defined uh, now and also to gain uh, some credibility. I think it's important. It was also mentioned in the previous uh, discussion. First, to focus. Well, Spain was a country that before the crisis uh, already we had uh, all the estimates that that we had was uh, for a, for a, for a low potential of growth, and we know very well uh, and some of the of the of the challenges were already mentioned, duality of the labor market, high unemployment rate, persistence of the unemployment rate, low productivity, uh, uh, etc. We need to, to, and the crisis, the only thing that it does is uh, it creates even more need for these uh, challenges to, to be faced. And the only way to do so is by structural reforms. Uh, and then, of course, we have also to face the, 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 the public consolidation uh, challenge. Uh, I'm being emphasizing this uh, from the very beginning. It's not the time. The time now is for fiscal policy to be very expansionary, but at the, uh, at the same time, we have to acknowledge that one of the more negative uh, consequences of the crisis will be this uh, huge increase in debt. The structural deficit in Spain was already high before the crisis. It will only increase after the, 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 the crisis. Uh, and then, uh, for me, there, what it is important is uh, that uh, the, 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 the government, together with Parliament, they define the consolidation program uh, that uh, uh, will be applied only when the recovery is, is firm. But that, uh, I think the design has to be anticipated in order precisely to gain uh, credibility in the, in the economic uh, policy making. I think that's the combination of optimal uh, economic policies that I see for, for, for Spain right now, right. Maria. And, and, and based on what you said here, uh, you know, there's really a theme to your answer in which you repeat a number of times that there are companies that were not productive before uh, the pandemic. There's almost this risk of zombification of the economy. 
you also say that uh, this could really manifest perhaps uh, next year. I do wonder when you look at all of this and given the fact that you also repeated uh, insolvencies and solvency ratios a number of times in that in that answer, are you worried about that come perhaps the spring of next year and whether that could have any other uh, spillover effects? And I'm thinking perhaps banks and so on. I know you're also a supervisor, so I wonder how you combine all of this yeah. in, in your universe you're looking at. Yeah, I think, I, I mean, just to, to put it in a, a, I think a nice example, if you look at any financial stability report that has been uh, published since the beginning of the crisis, either by domestic uh, authorities or by international institutions, probably the, the, the main uh, financial, stability, financial stability risk that it is mentioned is precisely the one derived for uh, corporate insolvency. That's, uh, that's obvious. And of course, uh, the damage uh, uh, will be uh, first for, for the companies themselves. If we are not uh, able, let's say, to, to, to make this, uh, this uh, restructuring uh, process that I was uh, mentioned, but of course, um, the, it will affect uh, also uh, in, the, uh, in the end, also the banking, the banking sector. And this is another message that I've been emphasizing from the very uh, beginning of this crisis. Uh, we uh, started with a health crisis that uh, it has clearly transform an economic crisis and we have to do uh, uh, um, everything in order to uh, prevent that the economic crisis uh, translates into, into a banking crisis or a financial crisis in general because we know how uh, damage uh, is uh, uh, this type of crisis and, uh, and how uh, deep and how uh, profound and how persistent are those type of crises and uh, unfortunately we have a, 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 a very clear example with the global financial crisis that it just uh, behind uh, behind us and and the the message i guess could not be any clearer i mean you, you really framed it in, in that way you know this this cannot turn into a, a banking and financial crisis and uh there's another element to the first answer that you gave in which you said uh monetary policy still needs to be expansionary and it still needs to be present uh it's not a secret that there's a big ecb meeting happening in just a few weeks i wonder if without going into too much detail because we don't want to uh, perhaps get you in trouble, but I do wonder if you could tell us about whether there's already consensus around what that level should be, what you think that level should be appropriate, and also this is not just one thing that's going to be tweaked, but it's a part of a package. What does an ideal package look like for the Spanish central bank? Yeah, well, without entering into details, Maria, but I, I think I, I can tell you what, what it is the consensus. And the consensus, of course, is uh, on the on what's the, the economic situation uh, right now. And of course, it's very much uh, connected with what I've just said for, for the Spanish uh, case. Um, the, the persistence of the crisis also for the for, for European countries and for the Euro area in particular has been high. Let's just, uh, let's just look at the, the third quarter GDP of the Euro area that was still uh, above 4% below that of, of the fourth quarter uh, in, uh, in, in, 20, in 2019. The short-term indicators, the few short-term indicators that are available currently for the fourth quarter also signal a slowdown in activity uh, uh, and which could uh, only uh, be exacerbated uh, by the widespread implementation of, uh, of new measures to contain the, the health crisis that are now are affecting all uh, European uh, kind, uh, countries. Um, and then if you try to compare um, these the more recent developments with the, the forecast, the one that was published by the ECB in September, uh, there uh, in September there was a, an important assumption in the baseline that was uh, published by, by the ECB is that uh, this baseline was based on the assumption that the epidemiological uh, situation would not worsen in the near term. And of course, uh, the development since the projection uh, cut of date uh, appear to contradict or clearly contradict uh, this assumption. So this is uh, about, the, about the growth outlook. And if I focus now on inflation, I think we have also a, a clear uh, consensus. Well, first, that already the September forecast that was published by the ECB uh, with um, a recovery of inflation from around 0 0.3 this year to uh, around 1 in 2021 and 1.3 in 2022. Um, all, all these values, and in particular the medium term, the 1.3, is uh, well short uh, the medium term uh, price stability target of the of the ECB that, as you perfectly know, is an inflation rate below but uh, close to, to 2% uh, over the medium term. Uh, but then if we look, uh, uh, as uh, I've already da uh, did for the, um, done for the, for, the, for the growth outlook, if I uh, focus on, the, on, the, on inflation, again, 
just look at the at the at the last estimate of the ICP, uh, referring to to October minus 0 0.3. Look at core inflation 0, 0 0.2 uh, in two consecutive uh, months. Look at uh, consumer expectations, which uh, have also uh, held on a downward path uh, since uh, since March. Uh, look at the, the 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 market market expectations for for inflation again five year swaps for example which are uh, uh, again declining and at a very low uh, levels so in uh, all in all what we have is a very fragile economic situation and a very uncertain uh, recovery and at the same time uh, a very uh, also uh, uh, low level of uh, of inflation uh, and um, and of course, the scenario of potential slower economic growth in the in the in the short term uh, will only increase the risk of the anchoring of inflation expectations. And this is why already in our last meeting, the governing uh, council agreed uh, on making this statement of making it clear that uh, um, our uh, our willingness to to recalibrate uh, our tools in, in in December. As to what uh, uh, will be the tools that will be recalibrated, let me just say that my personal opinion here, uh, because we haven't discussed the details. Of, of this is that the recalibration of monetary policy instruments um, in response to this second wave should at least uh, focus or include uh, further uh, recourse to our uh, PPP and also uh, our uh, further recourse to our uh, TLTROs. And why is that? Well, basically because uh, if we look at uh, the experience of the last nine months, these are probably the two uh, main tools or the tools that have been more effective in, uh, in dealing with the crisis. So I think it's a natural thing to, to think that this should be used uh, again um, uh, as a response, uh, as, a pa as part of the response uh, for the second wave. And uh, just to follow up on this briefly, I remember just a few weeks ago when I was in, in, in Vienna and I spoke to one of our colleagues, uh, Governor Haltzman, he did say uh, cutting interest rates, it's, it's not working. It's putting a lot of uh, already pressure and anxiety on, on banks. We've already talked, there's a lot of movement happening in the banking sector. I wonder if you share that opinion about to, or as to whether interest rates and going further negative could actually be more challenging to face this time around and whether actually, or, or whether to some extent they could be counterproductive to the economy. Well, you know perfectly, Maria, that uh, uh, at the governing council, in our, um, in our uh, communication, in our forward uh, guidelines, we have not excluded the possibility of reducing rates. That's, uh, that's, that's clear. This is in, of course, our last uh, introductory statement. But of course, uh, it's also obvious uh, that whatever the number for uh, the effective lower bound uh, is, uh, uh, we know that this is very difficult to estimate. We are now closer than we were uh, just uh, uh, some some years ago. Uh, and of course, this is an instrument that, of course, you cannot uh, um, disregard completely. But of course, the the, the, the possibility of moving downwards is uh, now much uh, much uh, much lower. This is why I was not emphasizing this uh, this uh, as, uh, in this particular point. Right, and, and anyone who's followed your career knows that you have been very consistent about the idea of fiscal discipline, about uh, almost balancing your books and, and the idea of cutting down the, the debt pile over GDP. I also wonder uh, when you look at the whole policy mix and you look at the fiscal response that we've seen from a European uh, side, I wonder if you think at this point, given again, going back to the breaking news that we're kind of looking at today, that that recovery fund could be derailed and so on. Do you feel like this is still a situation where monetary policy is doing way too much and it really is time for the fiscal response to become more effective, but also I guess that the word is to be implemented well. Yeah, no, no, I, 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 I fully agree with, um, with that statement, uh, Maria. I, of course, I'm, 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 I'm pretty convinced that um, uh, our leaders uh, will uh, solve uh, the, the problems and in the end that we will have this, um, this fund uh, approved uh, by, by 1st uh, January. This is absolutely crucial. I've been emphasizing this from the very, uh, uh, beginning, um, the, the fact that uh, this crisis, the European uh, joint uh, actions were crucial, in particular for the European Monetary Union, of course, and there are several arguments for this, the degree of integration that we have, um, the, the, the fact that it, the, the, the crisis is global, it was also emphasized in the previous panel, but at the same time, it has uh, created a, a lot of heterogeneity in terms of the, of the impact, uh, and this heterogeneity is, uh, again, much better, uh, or at least if you want to avoid fragmentation, uh, to, to, to be uh, covered by uh, an European uh, response. And of course, the, 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 the European Recovery Fund is, uh, is uh, in, this, uh, in this regard, uh, absolutely uh, perfect. Right? The, it's a, it's a, it's the combination of elements that it has, the volume, first, of course, the, the fact that the, the way it will be financed, uh, it was also mentioned before, 
the, the, it will provide a large uh, scale issuance of supranational European debt, which can even uh, be, uh, well, in fact, in, the, in terms of the numbers, it will double the EU uh, supranational debt that we have today. Uh, this will boost the, the amount of safe assets available in, in Europe. I think this is also particularly uh, important. The fact that uh, almost half of, of the money will be uh, direct grants, uh, because we know that the multiplier for uh, this direct grants is, is also is also higher. But of course, uh, it was also emphasized um, by, by everybody uh, this uh, this afternoon. I think we would be uh, we would be making a huge mistake if we were to think that the, the mere receipt of the funds will be sufficient for for Spain in particular for, for all countries as well to achieve the, pro, the, the greatest possible benefit uh, from from them. And of course, uh, for that, what we need is to, uh, to 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 put in place a capacity to design and develop a sufficient volume of of, of new projects that are not. They are not only new, but that they are uh, also of, of high uh, added value. And at the same time, we need to guarantee a prompt execution of it because, of course, we need the money uh, the, to, to be implemented uh, now. And, as, uh, and, of course, this is a big a big challenge because, uh, as the Vice President was saying uh, in, in her initial intervention, uh, I mean, this is a, an investment plan. Uh, that it is incorporated into the budget, into the draft budget, that it, uh, um, I mean, we don't have any observation like this, uh, any uh, magnitude uh, like this in the last uh, 10 years. So I think it's a, it's a challenge in itself. And by the way, I want also to emphasize something that was mentioned by Angel. I think it's not only about investing, it's also about complementing the structural reforms. No? The, 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 this need that I was emphasizing before, uh, uh, the need for this country to enter again into a new wave of structural reforms. Uh, um, uh, I think it's very relevant, and I think even that the, the fund, uh, the fund could even uh, finance some of the transitional costs that sometimes occur with these structural reforms. This complementarity between uh, investment financed by the by the fund and structural reforms, some of them even financed by the by the by the fund, I think is absolutely absolutely crucial. And uh, Governor, I know you have to go, so I really want to uh, put you a question, uh, just a final question, because I know you have uh, also uh, other commitments today. But um, I, I wonder, you know, we've talked about monetary policy and the response from the European Union and the national response, too. There is also an element here about how do we leave the strategy, the sequencing that perhaps we could see in 2021, whether we should be leaving the strategy of very expansionary monetary policy in 2021 or whether that is too early uh, to even put to the table. So I do wonder in your mind, how important is it that this time we get the sequencing right, to do this in the right order? And I would also want to get your thoughts on, would you say this debate, if we have to go back to the old rules as soon as possible, is that even premature considering that we have very little visibility over what the virus could look like in the next six, eight months. Hmm. Do you mean about fiscal? Do you, worry, uh, do, do you mean about fiscal policy or about the monetary? Because, uh, sorry, I didn't almost, understand yeah. your... Yeah, almost both. The, the idea that, to some okay. extent, we have to go back on the fiscal front, but also the monetary policy. Yeah. Uh, how quickly do we go back to normal? Yeah. How much time do we really need to, to get visibility in the situation? Well, in the case of, of monetary policy, it is very clear what is the mandate of the ECB. And, uh, uh, well, uh, the, 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 all the monetary policy decisions will have to be and will be a uh, pretty sure condition on the, on the fulfillment of our mandate. And, uh, of course, the challenge now is uh, to fulfill the mandate because the inflation is very low, but uh, we will have to analyze uh, the situation in, in each uh, time. As, as regards uh, fiscal policy, um, well, um, there, again, let me make this, uh, this, uh, this, um, this suggestion. I, I'm, I'm, I'm making for the, for the domestic front, but I think it is applicable also for the European front. It is clear, we are all defending that uh, fiscal policy should be very expansionary. Uh, at the same time, I think it's important uh, to, uh, to keep in mind that uh, um, fiscal uh, stability is also absolutely crucial for the European Monetary Union. And this is why uh, fiscal consolidation in the Spanish case on all those countries that have, uh, will have a, a, a relatively high debt to GDP ratio after this crisis will have to, to proceed with the consolidation uh, phase. Uh, but of course, the important he thing here is also uh, how gradual is this consolidation. Um, but at the same time, the graduality of the fiscal consolidation is not independent. On the contrary, it's absolutely dependent on the credibility 
of the domestic policies. And this is uh, precisely was, uh, why I was defending for the Spanish case that, okay, let, let uh, do whatever it takes on the fiscal front during 2020, uh, during 2021, uh, or even an extension uh, after 2021 if needed, but please provide to markets, provide uh, to citizens a framework on which uh, you guarantee that uh, uh, you will behave well, so that you will proceed with the fiscal consolidation uh, after what's in a gradual manner. And if you gain this cred credibility, the, the market will allow you to do it uh, in a gradual manner, uh, and this will be absolutely uh, uh, very positive, very, very positive for, for, for the euro. So this is applicable for Spain, but I think it's absolutely applicable for, for the euro area as a, as a, as a whole. And, and of course, we can enter into the discussion of modifying the, the European uh, the European rules. Uh, but uh, uh, even with the current framework, I think this attitude of this uh, this uh, line of action is uh, uh, is, uh, is absolutely uh, defendable. is uh, is compatible with the with the framework that we have today. And I, I know that I said this was the final question, but this will really be the final question. What about consensus? How key is that? And I mean it on all types of level, uh, not just the monetary policy of the European Central Bank, but also your consensus and coordination with uh, the European Commission. And I would also say in Spain, it's been very difficult to gather consensus, especially around the politics. So how key is it that we manage to do get to get that consensus? I think it's very important because, uh, Maria, what I was trying to emphasize today is that it is not only the policy, um, the policy, the optimality of the policy response is not only about short-term measures, it's also about combining them with medium-term uh, measures, some of them in particular, those uh, related to the, to the fiscal consolidation front that will affect this country for many, many years. Um, of course, when, do, when you do a, a plan for fiscal consolidation, when you prepare uh, or you even execute a, a, a structural reform, it's because you want to, it to last. If you don't have an agreement uh, within, uh, within, within Parliament, and uh, of course, the likelihood of uh, this uh, uh, structural reform being modified uh, by, by, by a new parliament in the future is very, very high. And of course, that's, that will be very, very damaging. Of course, here, the, 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 I would say the challenge is that consensus doesn't uh, lead to, to inaction. That's, uh, that's, the, that's, the, that's the problem. And this is why when, when, when attending uh, uh, hearings in parliament, I've been asking all uh, all parliament to, 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 to be flexible in order to reach uh, uh, such, a, such a consensus. That is absolutely essential. Also at the European level, for sure. And, and, and we've seen that it is possible is that a uh, July meeting happened uh, five days, but in the end it did real good results. So, um, Governor, we thank you so much for your time. We really appreciate uh, you taking the time, taking this questions, Q&A. Uh, I also want to thank you on a personal note for, for making yourself so available and really answering questions in a very clear, direct way. We really appreciate it. And I think it's great for all institutions to see that, that transparency. So I really want to thank you. And, and here at Bloomberg, we also want to thank you for that. Thank you. Thank you very much, Maria. And thank you to Bloomberg uh, again. Appreciate it. And on that note, we have come towards the end of our session. Now, we could have gone longer, but unfortunately, we're bound by time. But I hope that you had a good, successful uh, session, that we all came out of this with uh, some good ideas and that this has been uh, or hopefully it's been enriching for everyone. We hope to see you again next year at the Bloomberg Capital Markets Forum, the Spanish edition. And this time, hopefully, uh, we can do it in Madrid and we can see each other in person because uh, I'm sure we can agree we would have a very good time. So thank you so much. Appreciate it. And that's it until next year.